Father, you bring beauty from ashes. You bring, you, you take that which the locust has eaten. You restore us. And we pray that as we come this morning, we recognize the restoration that you want to bring. Bless us today. Help us to worship and praise well as we guided by your hand in your name. Amen. Our first song this morning is Happiness is the Lord. It is not in our hymnal, but we've got it on the on the PowerPoint. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within Number 560 is, I believe, in a hill called Mount Calvary. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. Luke 23, 33.
is the old rugged cross. This is one of those foundational things for us, is that old rugged cross, because Jesus died on that cross for our sins. Number 228, 228 is the old rugged cross. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown, which the Lord will give to me on that day, 2 Timothy 4, 8. Just if I don't listen. 
seated. Take a few minutes and look to the Lord in prayer. There are a list of requests in your bulletin. Continue to keep them close as you go through your week, lifting up one another. I hope that each of you gets to know one another here so that even if they don't, the requests don't appear here in this bulletin, that you're still praying for one another, caring for one another, loving one another. For those online that join us that way, if you have requests, please call them in. We'll put them in. We pray for you as well. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you with praise. We come before you with rejoicing. You've done so much for us. You have blessed us and carried us and lifted us. We give you thanks. We bow before you, God of the universe, one and only creator. We don't come without hurt. We don't come without pain. We don't come without struggles and hardness. It doesn't, it doesn't stop us from praising, but Lord, we lay these things before you. We pray that evil would be conquered. We pray for restoration where that is needed. And when restoration does not come, we pray that you would step in. Our Heavenly Father, might we demonstrate simply by our lives in the culture, in the society that we live, that we don't live these charmed, undisturbed lives, but in the midst of both rejoicing and sorrow, good and maybe not so good, we still can worship because we have a God that we count on. We have a God that we trust. We have a God that is taking care of us. Thank you for those that sit here this morning. Thank you for those that join us online that we see throughout the week. Lift them up, encourage, bless, guide, and keep them all. We thank you for all these things, Lord, in your name. Amen. The ushers would come. We'll receive the offering at this time. Pray. Father, you are good to us, and we thank you. Rejoice in you, our Savior. Bless these gifts. Use them for your kingdom in your name. Amen. As Christians, we're here to light a fire, but that's not the same, is it? No, not the a journey day by day filled with laughter and with pain but I know that he is with me through it all when with clouds my path is still storms of doubt arise within I find refuge in the shadow of the cross
prayed with Don and Jackie, prayed for them, and I twisted their arm to come in and share, come up this morning, this morning and share the results of the festival that they had yesterday. So come over. I think they're tired, so if they fall asleep in the middle of this, we give them excuses, but just share a little bit about how it went. That's good. Unbelievable. It was, if you could, you know, and I know a lot of you have experienced this, to spend a whole day with God and His Holy Spirit moving amongst His people. That's what we did yesterday. It was unbelievable. Um, Carrie showed up, and I looked at one of, I looked at one of uh, the leaders in the group, and I said, she's from our worship team, and I'm volunteering her. So if you need her, throw her up there. I heard they did. I heard you got two songs out of the thing. Um, the reason I didn't notice her is at that time, talk about miracles. Holy cow. Um, I was talking to Don's ex-brother-in-law. Don and I have been married 35 years. I've seen this man around forever. It's the first time I ever talked to him. And we prayed together. It was just awesome. I mean, yeah. you really need to understand the whole circumstance. And it was so fun talking to him. Julie and Phil came for the concerts. Wasn't the concerts great? Oh, my gosh. Um, I was on the prayer team. We had nobody to pray with. Nobody came up for prayer. And I think it's because I was watching the crowd. Everybody loved the Lord there. I don't think he had anybody he had to woo because I think they were all there with him or else there were some pretty healthy seeds planted, let me tell you. It was just, it was so much fun. We had, I, I have another twin, Diane. We're triplets now. Triplets, yes. Okay, and I met her yesterday. She goes to Hope Vale. What fun. We had so much fun all day long. I'm going to let Don talk. Yeah, I, when Pastor asked me if I wanted to speak today, I said no. Um, and that's because I, I usually don't do real well in front of people unless I have something somewhat prepared. And I say somewhat prepared because I always forget something. Uh, but uh, it was just, like I said, it was amazing. For me, I haven't seen most of these people in 50 years. Uh, they're coming from all across the country, uh, a, couple, a couple of them out of the country. And uh, the, see their kids as well, which I hadn't seen in so many years, and some of them had newer kids. But it was just uh, an amazing time. Uh, prayer would break out anywhere in the parking lot. You know, you'd see people gathering in prayer. And uh, just... Kids saying to their parents, you know, that was like that back then. Why isn't it happening today? You know, and that's what we've got to go forward with from <clears throat> this group and from us, of course, too. But this should embolden us that, that we can do this again. You know, God can move again. And he moved all across the entire country. Uh, the people from Indiana said it was the exact same time that it happened here. The exact same time it happened in California. So it was uh, just an amazing time. We, uh, the, the bands were amazing. Um, to hear Honey Tree with her voice just as perfect as it was way back then, it was, it was just amazing. She's got, still got a great voice. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think she moved a lot of people to tears. And of course, Steve Todd, which was one of our leaders back then, he uh, became my pastor. But anyway, he uh, ended up giving a message about one of the guys who had just come to the Lord in 1974. And he was, and, and Steve had started at uh, 911 dispatch. And uh, a policeman walked up to him and said, uh, I know this guy was your friend. Well, Steve Todd had known him longer than I did. Um, and <clears throat> he, um, he was a drug dealer. A lot of these guys were addicts that came into the Lord at that time, and he was a drug dealer. And he said he knew that once he quit doing that, he probably would be killed. And, and he gave his drugs to a friend, and Steve goes, well, that's not really what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to just get rid of them. But he gave it to a friend. But anyway, he, uh, the policeman 
I walked up to him with the 911 dispatch. I go, no, this guy was your friend. And something happened like I've never seen everything, anything like this in my life. We opened up the trunk of a car and his, it was a smile on his face. He was dead, but he was a smile on his face. So I've never seen anything like that before. So the way that, that God can move us, the way that he wants to use us and, and want to be useful, we want to be useful for him. So um, just, we just got to keep praying that, that, that he does another move like that. You know, or a new one, a new thing. Second <laughs> Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 to 19. The Apostle writes, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us <clears throat> the ministry or the word of reconciliation. Bernard Katz is a German-born British physician and biophysicist who is noted for his work on nerve physiology and shared the Nobel, Peace, or the Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine in 1970, he says organized religion is the world's largest pyramid scheme. Jesse Ventura, an American politician, actor, retired professional wrestler, believes organized religion is a sham and a crutch for weak-minded people who need strength in numbers. It tells people to go out and stick their noses into other people's business. Julia Child, can you hear her voice? <laughs> American chef, author, television personality, recognized for bringing French cuisine to America, declared, I hate organized religion. I think you have to love thy neighbor as thyself. I think you have to pick your own God and trust him. <clears throat> Grammy award-winning American singer-songwriter Jewel acknowledged, I never found much comfort in overly organized religion of any sort. We hear the phrase, organized religion. We, uh, people look at organized religion. We look at organized religion. What is it? I think a lot of people that talk about it have no idea what it is. What's organized religion? Organized religion is a structured system of faith or worship, especially one followed by a large number of people. It is a faith system with an overarching structure in place to define doctrine, standardize worship practices, and administrate the organization. Organized religion often dictates the conduct and rituals used within the context of a faith system. That's the, the definition, or a definition, of organized religion. <clears throat> what we do in this church <clears throat> every Sunday morning is organized religion. You know, I preached this three times already, and I didn't have this problem. I think it must be you guys. <clears throat> What we, do on, what we do here on Sunday morning is most likely organized religion. In fact, what we do here would actually be considered old-fashioned organized religion. I say that because we are traditional in every sense of the word. We, we meet at the traditional 11 o'clock in the morning. We have a praise team, but no drums, no electric guitars, no amplified flutes or clarinets. Your preacher still wears slacks, a collared shirt, and a tie, and if he could fit one, a suit coat. We like the hymns. And even though our praise team and music people regularly incorporate choruses and hymns together, we don't sing new choruses. Our probably The newest chorus we sing is probably 30 or 40 or 20 or 50 years old. 
Now, understand that I don't see that as a negative. You know what I just said? I don't see that. I don't, I don't see that as a criticism. In fact, <clears throat> I see it as a good thing. I, I see that what we do here on Sunday morning brings stability to life. When you come on Sunday morning, you know what you're going to get. And for better or worse, it brings constancy and stability and strength to our life in a, in a world that seems to be constantly changing. In my opinion, it's nice to know when you come to God's house, when you open up the doors and we sit down here, we're going to catch something that is stable. Now, we could go too far with that and, and, and not change. Uh, maybe I should wear a pair of holy jeans. I don't know. I won't. It's not within me. The, the point I'm making is how we look at organized religion is really the key to achieving a worshipful experience. If I come looking for religion, then I will see organized religion, and it will most likely fit the descriptions that we, the four descriptions that we had in the beginning. But when I come looking for someone, if I come to this church and you know what you're going to get, you know that when you come in here, we start, the praise team is going to sing one song, I'm going to pray, the praise team is going to, we're going to sing four songs, I'm going to get up and pray and take the offering, and then I'm going to preach and we're going to pray and you're going to sing a song and you're going to go home. But when you come looking for the Messiah, when we come looking for the Savior, this goes beyond religion, this becomes worship. This becomes fulfilling. It depends on what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for a system, I can probably find it. If I'm looking for the Savior, I will find that as well. What we come looking for makes a huge difference. I see clearly. And when I see God clearly, it makes a difference in my life. It makes a difference in the culture in which I live in. I've read this verse before. And I'll probably use it again. It bears repeating here. Jesus is having this conversation with the religious leaders, and he says this, but you do not have his word abiding in you because you do because him whom he sent, you don't believe. You search the scriptures for in them, you think you have eternal life, but it is these that bear testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you might have life. People come looking for religion, but they look for religion in religion. We come looking for a relationship. We find that relationship in God. Now, I, relate, religion is good for us. I, I, religion has its value. The Wall Street Journal, I don't know when, some time ago, published an article by a David Destino called, Is Religion Good for Your Health? And they put a couple studies together. The data said this. Found, it found that religiosity, and that's an interesting word in and of itself, Religiosity improves mental health. Attending services at least weekly or meditating regularly reduces feelings of depression, increases feelings of life satisfaction and purpose, even among adolescents. So even, even the secular community recognize that religiosity, religion is good. But if all you're looking for is religion, you're only going to find an empty shell until Jesus enters into that. I have no problem with religion. I mean, I mean, I'm a pastor of an organized religion. But beyond that, we see Christ in this. We see God in this, and that's what makes a difference. It all depends on what we see, what we're looking for. <clears throat> it isn't until we come looking to Jesus that we clearly see where peace and joy abides. The same is true about the people that we see every day, the people that we see and that we love and that we like, and even the people that we see and that we love and we don't like. We begin to see them differently when Christ becomes the ruler of our life. We're talking about the basics of our faith, and we've been through several weeks now. We're, 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 building, we're, we're building this, trying to build this desire, this passion, to begin going out and sharing the testimonies that we've been working with. And, and many of you shared last Sunday night with now we, we need to begin seeing people differently than we see them now. The, the passage we read, Paul says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. What does he mean by that? What he means is when I look at you now, I don't see you only. I see a person 
for whom God is deeply in love with. I see a person who is, who is desperately in need of a Savior. I don't see a person with faults and, and, and good things and bad things and, and up and down. I see a person for whom God is deeply in love with and wants to come to the Savior. Remember this. God is not willing that any should perish. And when I stop seeing people just as people, but begin seeing them as God sees them, then my desire is to take that story that we began, uh, we began working on and developing, and I want to take that story, and I want to go out and reach people for Christ. Remember last week we talked about friendship evangelism, uh, working with the people that we know, working with the people that we work with, talking to them, getting to know them, and as we get to know them, finding those opportunities to share faith. Why would I do that? Because God loves them so much. And I see them now not as a person who annoys me or a person who is my friend or a person whom I work with, but rather a person who is deeply loved by God, needs a Savior, and I'm the one that can take it. Remember, God has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. One of Brian's favorite phrases is, we're all ministers of the gospel. It's not just me. We all take this gospel, we go out. So, so now we, begin, we need to begin seeing people differently than maybe we have been. I don't see them as people with ups and downs and flaws. I see them as someone who God loves, and I want to take Jesus to them. And I'm going to take these stories that we've developed and this friendship that I've cultivated, and I'm going to work to lead this person to the Savior. God has given us that ministry of reconciliation. <clears throat> we have confirmed our salvation. We have developed our story about what Jesus has done for us now. We're going to take that message and we're going to share it with others. We're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. In the process, and remember this is a huge process, but in the process we become different as well. Part of the basics of our faith is seeing ourselves in a different light, seeing ourselves complete in Christ as well. Uh, we are not the same person that we were before we committed our life to Jesus Christ. We become a different person. Not right away. But we become different people. When we allow Jesus to change our lives, we become different. Remember the passage says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed. The old is gone. The new has come. <clears throat> it's not just an outward change. 1 Corinthians says this, 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither uh, fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexual, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covers, nor drunkards, nor revilers, or revelers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. We were these things before Christ. But we are changed. God has changed us and is in the process of changing us. And it's not just an outward change. It's an inward change. In fact, it really begins, it's more powerful as an inward change. In Reader's Digest for September of this year, there's an article written by someone by the name of D.G. Marshall, who in his own admission, and this is not me saying this, this is him saying it, he said that he was a crude, cutting, selfish, egotistical, judgmental jerk. And if you want to know that, that it's in the September issue, it's page 94. I didn't make that up. To fix himself, he was, a radio, he was a radio show personality, and he said his radio show, basically he just trashed religion, he trashed people. Uh, kind of his call, his draw was to just be cutting and sharp and nasty. <clears throat> so he recognized he needed to fix himself, so he took a three-month vow of silence, and he walked the Camino the Santiago Trail, which is in Spain. It's a 1,200-year-old series of trails in Spain. And he says he learned a lot about himself. He actually succeeded in not speaking for 
three months, and he walked, I think he said, 600 miles on the trail. It, it ends in a chapel, and then he spent time in the chapel there for a couple of weeks. And though he says he acts differently than he did previous to his commitment, he said it's been very hard and changes come very difficult. When he came home, his wife still left him. He, he still found himself to be very judgmental with everybody. He, didn't, there's, uh, he wasn't biased. He was critical of everybody. And, and maybe he didn't say it, but in his heart it was there. His radio show didn't get any better. It just got just as worse. Just as worse. There you go. It's just as bad. Good thing I don't talk for a living. Um, but now, there's the, what, he, what he did was, was good, and what he did was incomplete. So his wife left. Now, it's encouraging to know that after two years of separation, they began dating, he and his wife, and they're back together now. That's a good thing. I'm, I'm happy to read that kind of stuff. He quit his job. He quit the radio. He realized that was part of the problem. Uh, he just gravitated toward meanness, and so he quit his radio program. He actually lived with his wife now in a 100-acre farm in Caledonia, Ontario, Canada, where he's, he just he works on the farm. And then a couple times a year, people come up and they do this uh, three or four week of silence and they debrief that. And, and I'm glad for the progress that this gentleman has made. And, and I'm glad that he did recognize that changes had to be made. The problem with the whole article is the area of life that had to change didn't change. You know, there's, there's a core part of us, there's a core inside of us that has to be rejuvenated, has to be remade by God. It has to, it has to go in and it has to, God has to, and the Holy Spirit has to change things within us before He can change us outwardly. And some things will, outwardly will change quickly, some things will not change so quickly. It's like looking for religion without God. Looking to church to fix us that's not the answer the answer is god you cannot put a band-aid on a broken bone you have to go in and fix the bone and then let muscle and skin uh, grow grow over it and grow back together it's the same in our spiritual life i can't just stop doing bad things there has to be a change inside of me and that's what paul is talking about in those passages we become a new creation i uh, one of the things that popped into my head as I was going through this, we're not a patched up person. God just didn't put patches on the, on the bad spots. He changes us. He makes us new. We're fresh and clean and new. God changes us from the inside. The, uh, the great prophet Ezekiel writes, I will give you a new heart. A new heart. And put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and I and will do them. The apostle Paul declares, but you have not so learned Christ if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which is created according to God, in true righteousness and holiness. That you put on, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. I, I'm, I'm not as worried about outward actions for a new believer as I am that God has truly changed their hearts or is in the process of changing their heart and making them different. God doesn't just whitewash the outside. God fixes the problem. God doesn't just deal with symptoms. No, He does deal with symptoms. We can start with that. He changes the problem. He fixes the problem of our heart, of our hatred, of our sin, or whatever. Do you believe that? Do you believe that you are a new creation in Christ? We need to believe that. Because when you go out to share your faith, you know what you're going to hear? <laughs> I remember when you were a kid, you weren't so good. Okay? The Bible says a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. Well, you know why? Because in your own hometown, they knew what you were. And whether you've changed or not, 
old thoughts and old memories die hard. They're also going to hear this. Well, you're not perfect. You know what? They're right. They're right. Because we so, so we come to we come to people and we, we want to share our testimony. We want to go out and share our testimony. People go and people might throw those things at us, and we go, "Yeah, I agree with that." But God has made me new, and and am I where I need to be? No, I'm not where I need to be. But God has made me new. How many have seen this before? My father wore this button years. I mean, we're talking decades ago. You know what it stands for? Carrie. Please be patient with me. God is not finished with me yet. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. This gives a little better. That's what we tell people. We don't go out there and say, well, I've got it all figured out now, and God has made me now perfect. Now let me guide you to perfection. No, no, we go out there and go, look. In fact, somebody shared with me, and it's kind of stuck with me, witnessing and sharing and giving out the message is simply one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. Because we're not, we're not there yet. Now, we are there in the sense that God has made us new. We are already new creations. Inside, we're there. God has redeemed us and saved us and sanctified us. We're in the process of being made new. Old habits die hard, but they do die. Thank the Lord for that. So we have to see ourselves as redeemed in Christ, uh, we I get this. Well, I can't I can't share my faith because I'm not perfect. Or I can't them to stop. I can't tell somebody else to stop doing that because I'm not perfect. And we're right, we can't. But see, when we share our faith, it's not about telling people how to live their lives. What is it about? When we share our faith, these stories that Brian and I are trying to get you to to learn, and when we're encouraging you to go out, what are, what are we trying? What are, what do we want you to tell people how to live their life? About Jesus, whoever said that, I don't know who it was. You're right. We want people to know God, not know me. Because I don't matter. We don't matter in the eternal scheme of things. Jesus matters. So when I go out there, it's not about me telling people how good I am. It's about me telling how a good God, what God has done for me, and what God can do for them. That's my story. My story is not... I once was bad and now I'm perfect. My story is I'm still struggling with some of this stuff, but God has made me new. And I'm walking a life honoring to Him. And I want you to have that peace and joy as well. I'm not there to share about myself. I'm there to share about Jesus and about what God wants to do. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. It's a powerful thing to tell Jesus what God has done for us and what God can do for them. We are not the same when he enters into our life. We come to the basics. This is is the point of this. Number one, we believe that God has changed you. You believe that God has changed you. Believe that. But pastor, you don't know what I struggle with. No, I don't, but God does. And the fact that you struggle with it tells me that God has changed you. If you were comfortable in your sin, I'd go, oh, I got a problem here. But if you're uncomfortable with your sin, that's God changing you. That's the Holy Spirit beating the daylights out of you because he needs to straighten you up. Believe that God has changed you. Believe that God is continuing to change you. And this is where we get to the outside. You know, uh, like I said earlier, old habits die hard. Sometimes it's hard to give up those things. And, and we wrestle with those things. And it's just hard to let, not, not hard to let them go, but hard to, to be released. And so that's where we get on our knees and say, God, you've changed me. Now make me look like what you want me to be. God is changing us. Philippians 1.6, be patient. He which has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Number three, believe that God is changing you. He is changing you. Not that, not just that he will continue to do it, but that it is, it is a process happening right now. It is a process happening right now. And then the last one, tell others about the change that God has made in you. Again, not how wonderful you are, not how great we are, but just what God is doing in your life and that God wants to do that in their lives as well. That's the next step in the basics is for us to go out 
begin sharing our story with somebody. Who are you going to share with today? Who are you going to share with tomorrow? Who are you going to talk to? Amen. It begins here. It begins with the cross. It begins by leading people to the Savior, leading people to the resurrected Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the change that, you, that you're doing and that you've done and that you keep changing us. Thank you, Lord, for the great blessing that you are in our life. Lead us now to go out and tell others. Lead us now to go out and, and, and share you with others. And we'll use our story. We'll, we'll use us as examples, but not as examples of what, what they need to do, but as examples of what God can do in them. Lead us, we pray, Lord, in your name. Amen.